Hi, I'm Natalia Angelini. And I'm Rebecca Rouse. Welcome to Holland Estates. You're listening and watching episode number 615. Today, we're going to be discussing a very interesting paper entitled Susceptibility to Undue Influence, the Role of the Medical Expert in Estate Litigation. And this just recently came across our desk, right, Rebecca? Yeah, I think it was published in uh, actually this month in the Canadian Journal of Psychiatry. And the authors are um, Nathan Herman, Kimberly Whaley, Deidre Herbert, and Kenneth Schulman. So quite the list of esteemed individuals there. Yes. And so <laughs> it, it, it caught our attention because it deals with a sticky subject area and that's undue influence, which in will challenge cases, it's, it's, it's you know, notoriously one of the harder items to prove. Yes, exactly. And it's also something that lawyers are increasingly asking medical experts to also opine on. And unfortunately, there hasn't really been too much work done in the area, as uh, the authors of the paper note. And so there's kind of a gap that they are trying to explore in this paper. Right. And, and that's one of the things they mentioned at the outset, right, that the role of the medical expert is more clearly to opine on I mean, it's always traditionally been to opine on capacity, right? And then when, when they're asked to go beyond that and opine on undue influence, it's challenging because this is really a legal determination that the court makes and the expert can aid the court by, by reviewing susceptibility to undue influence. Right, exactly. And that is basically the conclusion that, that the authors do come to is that the role of the medical expert in their view is, is to focus on susceptibility and to assist the court in that way. And obviously they go through, you know, some detail about that, which we'll get to, but that's the kind of key conclusion that they make. Right. And, and one of the things they note is that we can, you know, they can help the court understand how complicated, you know, cognitive, psychiatric and medical factors can affect capacity and make test, testators more susceptible to undue influence. But you know, when you look at undue influence, the, the, the definition has, I mean, it hasn't been universally defined by the courts. It's historically been looked at as, I guess, a, a more external coercion that really removes a testator's uh, or reduces their, their free will. And now that's a little bit different, wouldn't you say? Yeah, now there's kind of uh, the concept of more will substitution where there isn't necessarily coercion and you're just kind of there's some I guess lighter pressure that that nonetheless causes the testator to to change their mind right and, and it's more like a multitude of factors right it, it's it's it involves there's there's the influencer who's relevant but also the characteristics and susceptibility of the testator the nature of the relationship, um, the circumstances under which the influence is taking place, mm -hmm. and the outcome, obviously. Right. So, so I guess there's like this holistic approach to looking at looking at that issue. Yeah, and it one of I mean it, it's a little bit further on in the in the paper, but they they bring up the concept of how different factors can relate to each other. So if there's maybe a testator who's very vulnerable, what level of uh, influence is necessary to be called undue? Whereas if there's a testator who's less vulnerable, they could, or, or not vulnerable at all, they could still be unduly influenced, but it might need to be a greater level. So it's more of a sliding scale, I guess, type of thing. Yeah, that's a great way. To, yeah, I know. It's a, it's a great way to describe it. And, and it definitely makes this whole area a lot more nebulous and, and case specific, right? Fact specific. And when they, or when the article does look at some factors that have been associated with undue influence, maybe we can go through some of those because they're factors that the courts have really recognized as being important when making the determination. Mm -hmm. So yeah. So maybe give um, some examples, right? Yeah, for sure. And um, there, there's a lot of them. And unfortunately, as the paper notes, there haven't really been any studies on which of them, if there's any that have to be present, if there's certain ones that, you know, will will be sufficient to show some kind of susceptibility. But um, there's some that, you know, you would expect that, that kind of make intuitive sense. So if it's generally an older 
person, maybe they're frail, they might have cognitive impairment, being illiterate when you're focusing on the testator. Also the circumstances of the testator, they're living alone, maybe they're isolated, they may have recently lost a spouse um, or they have language barriers, uh, things that kind of um, leave them more isolated and with less uh, support system. Yeah, and then when we look at the influencer, some of those characteristics tend to be that more often it's male than female. They may have mental or physical health problems. They may have financial stressors or be unemployed. They may live with a testator and be sort of an informal or formal caregiver and, uh, or may even be a suitor. Mm -hmm. And we do see, right, and what are we seeing? We're seeing more and more like, predatory marriages, those kinds of cases uh, coming up in the court system as, mm -hmm. as a population ages. So interesting, yeah. kind of a similar animal there. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's something to be, um, to be alive to yeah. a lot more and more. Uh, and then the relationship between the testator and the influencer, if there's some kind of dependence there, if they, they provide care and then they threaten to withdraw that care, they threaten to put them, you know, in an institution, that kind of thing can unfortunately uh, be effective in, in, you know, putting pressure on someone, especially if they're in that vulnerable kind of situation. Yeah. Yeah, and, and, and although like this article, it's not really long, but it is dense. And one of the main takeaways though, if, I, if, I'm, if, if in my mind, I'm sort of simplifying it is really that the expert's job or role is to really primarily focus on the susceptibility of the test data, right? So the influencer, mm -hmm. although that individual is relevant, the, the focus is for sure going to be more so on the test data in order for the expert to really help the court. Yeah, exactly. And there's certain, you know, it, it's really taking the focus back on the medical side of things um, and, you know, focusing on symptoms and syndromes like cognitive function, psychiatric symptoms, uh, physical wellness, and all these kinds of factors like that we just listed, they're less of, of, of a focus under the approach suggested in this paper. And I guess it would be that the court is more going to be assessing those types of factors taking into account the medical experts view on all of these more medical related factors. Right. And as, and as litigators, that should help us uh, be able to defend the expert's opinion and have that evidence accepted in court, right? Whereas if you wade too much into the influencer territory with your expert, um, perhaps there's more risk of, of, of that opinion coming under attack. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Hundred percent. I think it, it definitely helps the experts' opinion strong to be stronger and more supported by their expertise. Yeah. Yeah. So I think the the helpful part of this article is it it's tackling something that we don't see a lot of um, uh, formal writing on. So it's great to have this kind of commentary out there by such esteemed authors and practitioners in this area. And it really illustrates the important role that experts play in, in this litigation. And, and I, I dare I say their role is going to become more and more and more central mm -hmm. as, as, as we get more of these cases with, mm -hmm. with our population. Definitely, definitely. Well, yeah, I, I mean, on that note, I think I mean, the conclusion is, is really, it's clear in the paper, they, they, they do a great job. And I, I think, think it's uh, an excellent paper. And I think it'll open the door to more work in this area and more clarity on the topic. Right, and it may help guide other experts who are, who are getting asked to give these kinds of opinions. So I think, unless you've got any other comments, Rebecca, that brings our chat to an end. Uh, we will we will put a link to the paper uh, up on our website, and uh, so so that concludes our podcast. Until next time, we want to thank you for listening and for watching. I'm Natalia Angelini. I'm Rebecca Rose. Should you have any questions, please email us at webmaster at hollandhall.com or leave a comment on our blog.